We are very fortunate to have as our keynote speaker this morning one of the leaders and founders of the field of religion and ecology. It's truly an honor and privilege for me to introduce Mary Evelyn Tucker. I owe an immense debt of personal gratitude. Wow. <laughs> because she's the person who instilled in me the confidence to pursue a path that I thought was there but didn't really know existed. Wasn't sure if it existed. Um, more than a dozen years ago, I was reading the book that she edited, Buddhism and Ecology, on a plane out of SFO in my job working here in San Francisco. And my seatmate asked, um, are you a graduate student? And I was like, no, I'm just reading this book. But before long, I said, okay, somebody's doing this. And I started looking for a program where I could study environmental issues and religion and their influence on each other. And there wasn't one. So, but reading this book gave me the confidence to say, okay, let's, let's do this. And I, I went to Yale, um, where I had another great mentor, Stephen Keller, who, who encouraged me. And then subsequently, Mary Evelyn Tucker and, and John Grimm went there and really launched the program in religion and ecology at Yale where they co-direct the Forum on Religion and Ecology that is the network that brings together so many people all over the world who are interested in how these issues intersect and brings together justice and gender and economics and, and science and policy uh, into the discussion of these questions. So as you know, Mary Evelyn has so many diverse accomplishments um, along with um, directing the Forum on Religion and Ecology. She and John Grimm held 10 conferences on world religions and ecology at, at Harvard back in the 1990s that led to the publication of 10 volumes on the different world's religious traditions and ecology. And it was one of those books that I was reading on this plane out of SFO. Um, more recently, she and John Grimm have published um, Ecology and Religion with Island Press which one reviewer called a comprehensive review of the field of religion and ecology from two tireless proponents of this critical dialogue, a landmark publication that will move forward shared understanding of the contributions that religion can make to global ecological flourishing. So I encourage you to check out that book. It's called Ecology and Religion um, from Island Press, and it's a wonderful overview of the history and the whole field of religion and ecology and all the many streams that feed into it. And of course, um, Mary Evelyn, together with Brian Swim, wrote the Journey of the Universe book and together created the Journey of the Universe film, which has won many awards, and including um, uh, Emmy, and um, has, has been shown widely to much acclaim. So let's welcome Mary Evelyn. <laughs> here, of course, is the planet itself and what's required of us, which is going to be everything. 
But I'm going to begin with this note that I think is hopeful. And that is, the word sustainability, even though we might not all like to use it, we like flourishing and so on, but we know that sustainability has been part of the natural and social sciences by and large. All of these, especially science and policy and law, have driven the action in economics. But here's the opening for people like ourselves. That we need a broadened sustainability. We need what's being called environmental humanities. And that includes history and literature and arts and philosophy and religion. Because in case you didn't notice, academia has an allergy to religion. Um, but we've got to reclaim that ground. And environmental humanities is a way forward. Why? Because it picks up on human behavior and motivation, past history and challenges, artistic creativity and resilience, humanistic values and ethics, and cultural and religious perspectives. This is an amazing moment for the collective work represented here. Even E.O. Wilson um, says, let's also promote the humanities, that which makes us human, and not use science to mess around with the wellspring of us, the absolute and unique potential of the human future. There's a major scientist at Harvard saying, aha, humanities are on the horizon. Now, why is this so important? Because we've got to leverage more information, and I should really say wisdom, um, for flourishing. Why? Because the climate science is not communicating. Climate policy has until very recently been very deadlocked. So there's this call for interdisciplinary approaches, that we need a viable ethics, and we need engaging stories. And this call is coming from the international community, from the UN community, from scientists, from the IPC reports, and so on. So climate change awareness and action is right on the horizon. Um, oops, sorry. But this flirt Flourishing future is going to require this coming together of science and values which have been so separated, um, especially in academia. So we need cultural values and ecological understanding. That's what the forum at Yale is doing, but also what e the ESR program is doing right here at CIAS. And we want to encourage that uh, here in this creative Bay Area. We also need engaged narratives drawing on scientific discovery and humanistic insight, which is why we did Journey of the Universe. Um, so that these two projects assist science and policy in valuing the complexity of life systems for a flourishing future. Valuing is what's absent from the way science has dominated environmental studies programs up until now. So Thomas Berry, who was mentioned, of course, is a huge inspiration for this. He said years ago, we have ethics for homicide and suicide, but not biocide and genocide. And it's on that level that we need to rethink what we are up to. So attitudes and behavior toward nature are certainly shaped by the world's religions, but by environmental ethics, by biophilia, that term Ed Wilson and Steve Keller developed, a love of nature, by aesthetics and the arts, and by empirical knowing and by science. We also want to put right out there from the beginning the problems and promise of religion. Of course we know it's more than evidence, the intolerance, the fundamentalisms, the conflict, the antipathy even to science. But we need to reclaim this ground. The largest number of people in the world are part of these traditions. A billion Muslims, a billion Catholics, a billion Hindus, a billion Confucians. They can't be left out of the conversation to solve uh, going forward towards a flourishing future. The power of the texts and tradition, the schools and seminaries, and the openness to science um, as well. So, what were we trying to do? We were trying to activate what, again, is present in this room, grassroots religious environmentalism. We helped do this film, Renewal, which is eight great, uh, case studies across the US. We did a conference bringing all those folks who were working on this, saying this is coming from the grassroots as many uh, movements has come. But it's also coming from leadership. We have now the Pope. We have this uh, amazing patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church who inspired the Pope. He called this crimes against creation. I'm down in Santa Barbara in 1997. This is ecological sin, what we're doing. He's been after this for a long time. 
The last uh, presiding bishop of the Anglican Church, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, herself a scientist, and the evangelical community, people like Joel Hunter. So the contributions of religion then to planetary flourishing, large numbers of people, moral and institutional power, cultural diversity and historical lineage, the language of spirituality, which we've got to recapture and bring forward, um, and certainly ethics. So here, going forward, what I'm going to suggest is that we're at a moment of the last 20 years of many people working on these issues, but we're scaling up now in two areas, which is what I like to call the field in academia, the students here and, and elsewhere, but the force in the larger society. This is engaged knowledge. This is knowledge and action completely coming together. Okay, um, So I want to just illustrate this with religion and climate change for the last 15 years. So this Daedalus volume, which is all online, was the first effort to get religions to think about climate change. And it came out of two conferences we did at Harvard. Um, and Bill McKibben's in it, uh, lots of people that, that you might know, because Bill McKibben's been very active uh, about the religions participating in this. So there's an academic component, but an engaged component. And that's what we did at the conference as well at the Yale Divinity School. I want to mention internationally, as we've been working um, the Iranian government with UNEP had sponsored two conferences in 2001 and 2005, and we're going again in April for a conference with UNEP, UNESCO, and the Iranian government. They know this issue is central to the Middle East. In Tehran, the past president, Hatami, when we were there, he's like, we're not worried about terrorism. We're worried about water and the future of the Middle East. Okay, there's only water in Tehran for eight hours a day when we were there uh, before. So, Interfaith Power and Light, Sally Bingham will be here this afternoon. Uh, we've got this grassroots movement that has spread to over 40 states. And all of this is culminating, I think, in what was visible last September in the People's March. I don't know how many of you were there, but it was electrifying. I'm a New Yorker. This was just an amazing day to see over 400,000 people. The spirit of it, the, the different groups coming together. And here was evident, 10,000 religious leaders were participating. It was a huge uh, celebration at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. All of this led in the very front by indigenous peoples. So powerful, so powerful. Um, I mean, I, meeting our students there, I was weeping for their future and the possibility. And a week later, someone came to Yale, the Todd Stern, who was our chief negotiator at the UN, and he says to me, Mary Evelyn, everyone at the UN was watching that climate march. Everyone. And he said, send us more from the religious communities to advocate for this. You see, they are listening, they are waiting. Now the encyclical, which Sean will speak about soon, has been, I think, the major transformation, lifting this up to visibility, the content, again, in integral ecology, science and values, people and the planet, um, bringing together the justice issues along with the environmental degradation. Now the audience, talk about scaling up. <laughs> You know, I've just mentioned how many Catholics, two billion Christians in total, um, and other religious communities have all come out in very positive statements about this. But education, in other words, this is going to go into the educational world, and it already is. The Jesuits are taking this very, very seriously. There's 28 Jesuit universities just in the U.S. alone, all of them having conferences on this and, and so on. There's 230 uh, universities in the world, and then the Jesuit um, secondary schools. When the Pope addressed the UN and the Congress in the fall, it was extraordinary, quite extraordinary. And as he left the UN, as you may know, the Millennium SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, were agreed upon by over 190 nations. He has given this movement a moral force that is not going to go backwards. It's here on the world stage, and people get it. Um, so the COP conference, again, was infused, and our colleagues say this at, at the forestry school, which is a very secular place, infused with this moral sensibility, infused with a sense. Native peoples were there. Religious communities from around the world um, were there. Now, I want to take a step back and say, 
how did we come into this work? Because everyone has their personal stories, and I hope we'll share more of those over the day. I went to Japan in 73, 74, very disillusioned uh, with the, the years here in 68. And when Nixon was elected, I said, I'm leaving. Uh, and I'm not coming back until he gets out of office. And it happened to work out that way. <laughs> but I became enamored of these traditions. Um, and there were very few foreigners in Japan at that time. So we have this, this, the Shinto tradition. Zen Buddhism became a huge part of my life, and still is. I came out of a Zen uh, retreat, and I'm on the, the, so, the subway in Tokyo, and I see the headline, Nixon resigns. I can come home. <laughs> um, but he also became fascinated with Confucianism, which is a tradition that takes politics. This is a castle. The Confucian uh, political structure was hugely important, and the Confucian educational structure was absolutely central um, to pre-modern and modern Japan. And we can talk about that um, anon, but Confucianism is what is the heartbeat of East Asia. And I'm going to show you a few examples of that now. Um, but here's Japan in 73, 74. Here's Fuji. Here's some of the consequences of industrialization. Um, I went to China some of 10 years later, Guilin here in the south. And as we know, the conditions in China are beyond the beyond. Um, this is why we did this work, thinking about what was going to happen to people around the world with rapid industrialization. Now, as well, my husband's work, John Grimm, is in indigenous uh, traditions, especially native peoples of the Great Plains, the Crow people. So we're adopted into this uh, family, the Burden Ground family. And he has participated in a number of rituals, especially the Sundance um, nine times. And watching these rituals on these high plains and the endurance, as everyone in this room knows, of native sensibilities around these issues is a huge inspiration for all of us. Absolutely huge. And it goes, of course, into the fact that the United Nations only really recognized religious and human rights of native peoples relatively re recently in this um, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We can spend the rest of the talk just on that issue. But this is what has motivated us. Um, it's why we did this uh, series that was mentioned, the conferences and the books and so on. It's why we created this forum to bring together what's now about 12,000 people from around the world, thinking about uh, what is our future and how can we make it flourishing for people and the planet. Now, as well, we were trying to say, let's open up what's even the notion of religion. It's not just monotheism or a belief in one God. It's not simply institutional forms, church. It's not fundamentalism or orthodoxy. It's not just moral teachings or sex, <laughs> despite what everybody thinks. Um, it's widening our lens to include world religions, especially Asian and indigenous traditions. But that's behind this project, too, you see, to open up the space for a much more sophisticated conversation on what inspires people around the world. And my travels in the last 40 years all over Asia has been so inspiring to see how people continue these practices, the work that Vijaya Nagarajan is doing in India with women and the Kolam, um, in the morning, uh, prayers and puja, and so on. This is so important for all of us to understand and um, take seriously. Now, here's a definition of Ronald Dorkin. A religious attitude involves moral and cosmic conviction, convictions beyond simply a belief in God that people have an innate, inescapable responsibility to make something valuable of their lives, and that the natural universe is gloriously, mysteriously wonderful. Do we agree with this? <laughs> we should give it up for Dork. <laughs> I mean, he was a marvelous Jewish legal scholar at NYU, um, just brilliant, and trying to think of these issues not in a conventional framework. Um, <clears throat> so religions, as we know, have inspired change. The abolitionist movement, civil rights, um, the Jewish and Christian groups still working on these issues. So what we're trying to do is what we think of as retrieval, reevaluation, and reconstruction. Every tradition has been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. They're not fossilized. They're not stuck in tradition. They need a push. And when they are pushed, 
as is happening right now, especially with this encyclical, every religious tradition around the world, there are statements of why this movement is important. They're linking up the ecology and justice and so on. You can look at this on our website. We have hundreds of statements, bibliographies of all of the world's religions um, and so on, and engage projects on the ground. It's exploding, really exploding. So what we're trying to do is suggest how humans relate to daily and seasonal cycles, the agricultural rhythms, the biodiversity and bioregions. We have, over time, woven ourselves into all of these natural cycles. That's what religious rituals are doing, and it's why uh, Christmas is at the time of the winter solstice, Easter you know, at the time of, of the equinox. And so we're trying to weave ourselves, ground ourselves in these extraordinarily complex processes of nature. All the rituals that we use are indebted to, to water or to a feeling of air and breath for meditation and so on. You see, this is what religious ecology is trying to recover, a sensibility of what that is like historically, but what it's like at present as well. The solar and lunar cycles, the stellar and cosmic phenomena. This is where we get into a, a cosmology of religion as well. So these two parts, religious ecology is a symbolic understanding of ecological interdependence, but it's also this sense of how humans are embedded in nature. Teak means traditional environmental knowledge, which indigenous peoples have, but all of the world's religions have. Religious cosmology are these stories of the dynamic unfolding of reality and how humans have emerged from the universe. So we are desperate for this kind of grounding, aren't we? In Earth systems, in the, the solar systems, in the universe systems. We are absolutely hungry and in a desert for where we belong and how we belong. And that's what this movement is about. This, this field and this force. So as, as Elizabeth mentioned, we have this book that is that's highlighting these. So trying to recover and restore the valuing of nature for flourishing, that we're part of living systems, not apart from them. That relationality means not hyper and hyper, hyper individualism, which has become the the name of Western freedoms. But it's hyper, it's distorted, so we've lost collectivity. The intrinsic value of nature not monetized. At our School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, everything's about ecosystem services and how we value them on a financial model. It is insufficient at best. Insufficient. But we've got to reclaim the grounds of how we speak about nature as a sacred value. When Thomas Berry's book, Sacred Universe, was um, given, we gave it to Columbia Press, and they said, let's call it Sacred Universe, I almost fell over, because academia doesn't use these kinds of words, you see? We've got to find the words that reclaim the language of why we love the Earth and its systems and its complexity and its beauty. So, respectful use, obviously, not exploitation, affirming this world, not just the next world, which all of the East Asian traditions do, hugely. This is not about escape to another world, okay? Um, and beauty. You know, we were just working on the blessing way of the Navajo for a lecture for one of our classes. Beauty before me, beauty behind me, beauty above me, beauty below me, beauty all around us. That's what we have to restore, this tremendous sense that we live in a universe infused with beauty. Now as well, how are we valuing humans for flourishing? This integral ecology, which will be spoken about more, but the well-being for nature and for humans, we have to identify these obstacles to flourishing, which is all around us, racism, sexism, migration, the toxicities of air, water, and soil, and of homes. The health issues are really going to bring us together. Just last Friday, I'm sitting at this conference at Yale at our school, it completely packed, 200 people, all about toxicities, all about lead poisoning. You know, Flint is the tip, the tip of the iceberg, right? The tip of the iceberg, and these are all younger scholars. They're dealing with what women are dealing with, with their families and stuff. So with climate change, we can't let go of the other environmental issues. 
uh, which involve environmental justice and so on. But toxicity and health issues are going to be so crucial. Which is why we've been working for 20 years on this series of ecology and justice at Orbis. As you can see, Brian's book, The Hidden Heart of the Cosmos, is in it, Our Worldviews and Ecology, Thomas's book, The Christian Future. At the very center there, that book of Leonardo Boff, Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor, is what has really influenced the uh, people encyclical. And all the other ones um, dealing with environmental justice, water, women, and indigenous peoples. Now, if we can take a step back to our planetary and our global situation, I want to highlight just a few things from China. Because we do get so enamored and absorbed in our own country. But I want to give of a sense of what people are dealing with around the world and what some of the possibilities are. So this was a conference this past summer that had journalists and scientists. The uh, environmental minister came to open this uh, conference and so on. But here's what many, many people across China are dealing with. There are 100,000 protests a year in China on the environment alone. Never reported. The, the sludge, the waste, the water problems, incomprehensible. Um, the pollution problems we know from Beijing, but every city is dealing with these issues. Um, now, against great odds, the Dalai Lama and Tibetan Buddhism and other Buddhist uh, uh, sects have been speaking out on this issue. For 30 years, the Dalai Lama has been speaking out. Um, as well, a younger Tibetan uh, Buddhist, the 17th Karmapa, who came to Yale last year and made a tour through the states, He's dealing with 55 monasteries in the Himalaya region who are focused on climate change. The diminishing uh, glaciers, the effects in that region are phenomenal. And he's trying to educate the monks and the people um, as to mitigation and ad adaptation, mostly at this point. Now, the area that I work in, Confucianism especially, there is a movement in China. How many of you have heard of ecological civilization? Okay, good. So, again, against great odds, this is now in the Chinese constitution that they've got to move towards ecological civilization. Xi Jinping, the president, mentions it often. It's in the party congress and so on when they meet in Beijing. Now, what are they drawing on? They're drawing in part on these cosmologies that we've just spoken about, religious cosmologies and ecologies, this interdependence of heaven, earth, and human. This is heaven, which means the cosmos, earth, and human. One non-dual, non-broken whole. These microcosm, macrocosm relations of human and the cosmos, the seasonal cycles, harmonizing with nature, cultivating nature. Um, this is at the essence of their tradition. And in 2008, we met with Han Yue, who was the Minister of the Environment, and said we need to draw forth our traditions for this transformation as well. Du Wei Ming, one of the great Confucian scholars who we've worked with, um, is doing this. He's gone back from Harvard to uh, live in Beijing at Beijing University. And at this academy um, in Hunan province, which is a province of 90 million people, for the last several summers, there have been conferences on Confucianism in particular and how it can contribute to a flourishing future for China. 90 million people. The governor of the province was there. All his ministers were there. The minister for, the, for uh, economics said, we have got to have a circular economy. They are thinking, because <laughs> they have to. They have to. So these conferences um, that I've just mentioned, but at the bottom there, there's a popular revival of Confucianism. Ten million copies of a book <laughs> have been sold. So it's government level, it's academic level, it's a uh, popular level, a revival of values for an environmental future. Um, and our conferences, books have been translated into Chinese as well. How do changes in diet, acting, diet, indigenous knowledge? And oh, yeah. that comes up. <laughs> China's always listening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. Well, I'm actually going to end, and that might have been the voice of my student who, at, at Yale, who was good enough to send just a couple of slides on her work, which is with indigenous uh, groups out in um, 
the province uh, board in Yunnan, where she's talking about the sacred forests and how they're sanctuaries of biodiversity, but what's happening with economic development and so on, and uh, how do they change their indigenous knowledge, et cetera. And he, this is a picture of the various groups that are reforesting on a local level and with government help, et cetera. So, I'm going to conclude um, with this slide and maybe just take a, a few questions, but the point here is the field and force for climate change action and integral ecology lies in this intersection of, et of ecology and ethics. That we need the cultural and moral values, we need educational establishments, we need leadership and grassroots outreach, and we need resilience and inspiration for sure. And that's the note that everyone in this room can understand, because this is the Bay Area, right? Um, this is California. But I invite you into this notion that the most renewable energy that we have, in addition to water, wind, solar, and so on, geothermal, is the energy of the human spirit, that resilience of the human spirit, the will to act, that is the most renewable energy we have, and we can make this transition into a flourishing future. Thank you very much.